Chapter 9 If anyone offers you a pie, Garrett whispered, don't eat it. I don't eat pies, Marla answered. Good, he said. Don't start now. The town of Merovin had once been an above-ground quarter of the city of Wither. At some point in the past, masons had arched over and buried the entire district beneath the streets and manor houses of the new foreign district. Above, visitors and ambassadors from every corner of the world went about their business, unaware of the hundreds of ghouls that scrabbled and feasted in the tunnels beneath their feet. The haze of countless little cooking fires hid the high-vaulted ceiling from view. The red glow of the flames glittered in the eyes of countless ghouls that now lifted from their pie-making to watch Marla and Garrett with keen interest. Norris made a rude sort of hissing noise. Pies, he said. It ain't right, you know. Then don't eat, Warren said. What's wrong with fresh meat? Norris whined. Not much fresh meat around here, Warren said. Anyway, I like pie. Norris shuddered. It ain't right. The ghouls of Marovin soon lost interest in the visitors and returned to their stooped preparations for the midday meal. Garrett and his friends made their way through the broad, zigzagging lanes, stepping over bits of crumbled masonry here and there. The ghouls did not bother to maintain the old town. They passed by a jagged-edged hole in a brick storefront from which a rhythmic chopping sound could be heard. Marla peered inside as they walked by and then visibly recoiled. Garrett looked in to see an old ghoul in a leather apron smiling at him. The ghoul held a rusty cleaver poised in one massive paw. A pile of meat on the scarred wooden table before him bore too much resemblance to something that might have been walking around conducting business on the streets above not too long ago. They hurried along quickly and presently began to hear the sound of an argument. No, not an argument, but a one-sided tirade. A rasping, panicked voice cried out, imploring others to action. You must find it! You must find the thief! The voice sounded almost human, but there was a buzzing undertone to each word. As Garrett drew closer to the as-yet-unseen speaker, the more alien seemed its tone. The three friends followed Norris through a large stone arch. Its iron gates lay rusting on the dusty cobbles of the ancient lane. Old buildings ringed what had once been a broad courtyard. Vast support columns grew up through their broken facades like stone trees, disappearing into the darkness high above. A low fire burned in the dry bowl of what had once been the town's fountain. Silhouetted against the flames sat a small, stooped figure with its face buried in its hands, weeping. Marla gasped and the creature looked up. The goblin's oily gray skin stretched tightly over spindly limbs. It wore only a ragged shift that might have once been red. Its three-fingered hands and two-toed feet seemed overly large for its frame, as did its wide, flat head. Long, pointed ears framed its noseless face. The goblin's wide mouth hung open, revealing rows of needle-sharp teeth, and its enormous golden eyes blinked in disbelief. The Goblin King leapt toward them, and Garrett stepped unconsciously to place himself between Marla and the beast. Instead of attacking, the creature flung itself prostrate onto the ground before them. Forgive me, my queen, it cried. Forgive me! Warren snorted. Well, Garrett, he said, it looks like you're the queen now. Garrett shot him an ugly look. Marla stepped past to kneel at the Goblin's side. She said, placing her fingers on the goblin's trembling shoulders. The goblin slowly lifted its head. Its wide, amber-colored eyes blinked. A look of transcendent adoration spread over the creature's face. My queen, it whispered. Marla smiled at him. My name is Marla, she said. Please, stand up. The goblin pushed himself up to a kneeling position, his eyes still locked on Marla. My queen, he said. I beg your forgiveness. Forgiveness for what? Marla asked. I lost it, he whimpered. It was stolen from me. Who stole what now? Warren demanded. The goblin's eyes hardened as he glanced toward the ghoul. Then he looked back to Marla with a penitent face. 
the flower, my queen. An evil spirit has stolen it. You lost your flower? Warren scoffed. Is that what this is about? Forgive me, my queen. I have failed in my duty. Marla turned to Warren. Do you know what he's talking about? Yeah, sort of. Warren scratched at his head absently. As long as my family has been in Merovan, the king has always been here, and he's always been guarding some sort of sickly little weed. It's not a weed, fool! The goblin's words were muffled as he pressed his face to the ground at Marla's feet. Yeah, anyway, he's always had this flower. Won't go anywhere without it. I guess he finally forgot where he set it down or something. I did not! The goblin howled, lifting his head to bare his teeth. Anna Gree stole it from me! Warren laughed. How did that old ghost steal anything from you? She doesn't have any hands. Not even ghost hands. I don't know how she did it! The goblin hissed. I didn't see her take it. How do you know she has it then? Garrett asked. I can feel it there with her, he answered. She has taken it to the hurtful place where I cannot go. Who is Anna Gree? Marla asked. One of the ghosts that flits around in the old city, Warren said. We stay clear of her territory, but I don't really know why. Not like she can hurt us. Ghosts can't really think for themselves, can they? Garrett asked. They're like zombies, right? They're nothing like zombies, Warren said. You can't even eat a ghost. Garrett frowned. I've never met a real ghost before, Marla said. Maybe we should go talk to her. Warren burst out laughing, and Norris joined in with a wheezing snicker. Marla looked to Garrett, a hurt look in her eyes. Well, if you won't take her, I will. You never find it on your own, Warren said, wiping his eye with the back of his paw. Norris's eyes flashed in the firelight. Don't trouble yourself, cousin, he said. I'll show them the way. Warren's face hardened. How do you know the way? I'm good with directions, and I like to explore. Warren's upper lip curled back on one side, revealing a long yellow fang. I don't take them. Of course, cousin. Norris dipped his head slightly his sharp smile unnaturally wide. Do you think your cousin's following us? Garrett asked. Yeah, Warren said without looking back at him. Garrett followed along in silence behind his friend. Marla was a few steps behind, looking a little uncomfortable whenever Garrett glanced back. Warren led them through a narrow, dripping fissure in the high, crumbling wall that marked Merovin's outer border. They emerged into another section of the old elvish ruins that lay buried even deeper. A pale, gauzy film hung over the egg-shaped doorways and windows of the ancient buildings. Cobwebs likewise obscured the brick arches that supported the new city above their heads. Warren paused when they reached a circular hub of lanes that fanned out in all directions. The ghoul sniffed the air. He grunted and picked the lane that grew thickest with spider webs and set toward it at once. Garrett shared a nervous glance with Marla and then hurried to catch up with his friend. They followed Warren further into the web-thick section of the old city, and soon found themselves traversing through a tunnel thick with silk strands that glowed an eerie green in the glow of Garrett's witchfire torch. Garrett's boots sunk into the thick, spongy blanket of dusty silk that coated the ground. Uh, Warren, he called out. I'm not sure we should be going this way. You want to see a ghost? Warren barked. So this is the way we have to go. Isn't there another way around? I don't know, Warren said. I just want to get this over with. You've already ruined the whole trip anyway. It's bad enough I got to deal with my cousin all week, and now you want to spend all day poking around in part of the city where there's nothing but ghosts and bugs. I'm sorry, Garrett said. I really just wanted Marla to have a good time. Warren snarled. It's all right, Marla said. We really don't have to do this today. We can try it again some other time. No, Warren shouted. Garrett wanted to show you a ghost, so we're going to see a ghost. Garrett looked at the walls of webbing all around them that seemed now to undulate and bulge disconcertingly in places. Oh, Warren, 
I think you should be quiet, he hissed. Oh no, I'm having a great time, Warren shouted even louder. This is the most fun I've ever had. He waved his long, shaggy arms over his head and rolled his eyes. Garrett, look out! Marla was suddenly beside Garrett, her hands on his shoulders. She lifted him easily aside as she kicked at something on the ground behind him. A brown spider the size of a small dog bounced off the far wall and then scurried away into the shadows. More spiders were squeezing through little holes in the silken walls of the tunnel. Ah! Garrett shouted, pulling the knife from his belt and brandishing the torch with his other hand. Marla, get behind me! She gave him an exasperated look, but did as he said. Warren had abandoned his tirade in favor of leaping to join his friends. He swung his arm in a scooping motion and sent one of the creatures flying. It bounced off the ceiling and rolled away in a ball, only to unfurl its legs, right itself, and join the scurrying crowd of arachnids now advancing upon the intruders. Let's go back, Garrett said. There's more of them coming from that way, too, Marla said. She brought her foot down hard on a spider's back. It made an awful, wet, crunching sound and lay twitching on the floor. Garrett grunted with effort as he bashed one of the creatures with his torch. It scrabbled away in a panic with tongues of witch fire flickering over its glossy carapace. Warren had the worst of them. The ghoul roared as he pinwheeled his arms, battling the spiders away with such force that soon many of them lay curled into balls upon the floor. Garrett yelped as a spider lunged forward to sink its fangs into his leg, or rather his boot. As uncomfortable as necromancer boots could be at times, he was at least grateful for their rugged craftsmanship. The spider's fangs could not penetrate the thick leather. Garrett jammed his knife through the monster's thorax and pried it off. He pushed it away. His skin crawled at the sight of the slimy goo that now coated the blade of his dagger. He looked back at Marla. His heart leapt with fear to see that she no longer stood behind him. Then suddenly she was there again, and just as suddenly gone once more. The girl moved with such speed that he only really saw her when she stopped to choose a new target. He watched her in bemused silence. She was amazing. Marla paused long enough to frown back at him, and then she was once again a blur of gray. She ripped a large spider off of Garrett's back and hurled it into the shadows. She stopped again, her hand on Garrett's arm, and a little smile on her face. Can I borrow your torch, dear? Yeah, Garrett slowly lifted his hand to offer her the witchfire torch, but it wasn't in his hand anymore. Marla had it. She spun and danced among the spiders, trailing witchfire in shimmering arcs and crazy swirls of emerald light. The thick impact of her blows on spider bodies punctuated the roiling, crackling whoosh of the torch as Marla beat them back. Garrett smiled in spite of his fear to witness the fiery beauty of Marla's defense. Warren growled. Garrett turned to see his friend, who was now completely covered in spiders. The ghoul flailed wildly, tearing the creatures free and casting them away. More scuttled in as quickly as he could knock them off. The spiders jabbed their fangs against the ghoul's thick hide, unable to penetrate it, but causing him considerable misery. Garrett leapt forward, slashing with his knife at one of the creatures clinging to his friend's leg, but the blade glanced harmlessly off its leathery back. Then Marla appeared wreathed in arcs of green flame as she swept the spiders from Warren's back with savage blows from her torch. A moment later, Warren stood, free of the beasts, yet still swinging drunkenly at empty air. He paused, opened his eyes, and brushed his paws over his shoulders, checking his back for spiders. Marla twirled the torch between her fingers and smiled up at him. Warren shuddered, wiping his palms on his shaggy haunches, he looked at Marla in wonder, then glanced down, shamefaced. Thanks, Warren said quietly. Yeah, thanks, Marla, Garrett said. You were amazing. Marla grinned, shifting her weight from foot to foot. Thanks for letting me borrow your torch, Garrett, she offered it back to him. Ah, uh, you better let her keep it, Warren said. He jabbed Garrett in the shoulder to get his attention and pointed further up the hallway. At the edge of the firelight, dozens of huge, scuttling spiders hung back, watching them. From the darkness beyond them, something even bigger approached. A spider the size of a horse crawled down the tunnel toward them. Its skin glistened in the torchlight, black and shiny. Dagger-like fangs flexed, their tips dewed with poison. Garrett glanced back over his shoulder to see more spiders scurrying up the tunnel behind them. What do we do? Garrett asked. I don't know, Warren said. 
Marla's expression turned grim. She held the torch before her like a two-handed sword. The spiders before them parted to allow their enormous companion to pass. Its long, spindly forelegs lifted tentatively as it regarded them with eight obsidian black eyes. Garrett's heart pounded in his chest. Horrible thoughts fought for space in his mind, but the worst of them was the realization that his friends were here because of him. I'm sorry I made us come here, he said. Warren looked at him, his eyes wide with fear. Are you kidding? he said. This is the most fun I've had all day. Garrett couldn't help but laugh. Marla laughed too. Same for me, Garrett, she said. They all laughed together, and then somehow their situation no longer seemed quite as horrible. Then a fourth laugh sounded through the web-shrouded tunnel, a high, girlish laugh. Warren looked shocked. Garrett, he said. I think the spider likes jokes. Think of something funny, quick. That wasn't the spider, Marla said. Marinal Iashawala, a voice called out from somewhere nearby. Shoo! Shoo! The spiders scattered, tumbling over one another to escape. One even scampered over Garrett's boot as he turned to let them pass. They fled up the tunnel into darkness or wriggled back into the thick silken walls. Even the monstrously giant spider wriggled its mandibles nervously and withdrew into shadow. The friends looked at one another. Warren shrugged. Whoever it is, Marla whispered, she speaks draconic. Great, Warren grumbled. Another vampire. I don't think so, Marla said, her voice trailing off as a portion of the wall's webbing stretched and tore free to reveal a dark, cloaked figure that stepped into the center of the hallway before them. The stranger pulled back the hood of her brown cloak to reveal a young human woman with a round, slightly downturned face, short brown hair, and large brown eyes that darted from Marla to Warren and settled on Garrett. She smiled hesitantly, she stood only a little taller than Garrett, and her weight shifted on the toes of her brown boots, as though at any moment she might run away. Is that Anna Gree? Garrett asked. Warren sputtered. Does that look like a ghost to you? The girl laughed again. Her eyes sparkled in the witchfire light. I am no ghost, she said, though I am Anna's friend. If you have come to harm her, I will not allow it. How could we harm a ghost? Marla asked. The stranger regarded Marla for a moment before speaking. The same way you harm anyone, really. With words. We just want to talk to her, Garrett said. I promise we won't try to hurt her. The girl looked back to him again. Her head tilted a little, and she leaned forward slightly as she studied him. My name is Garrett, he said. And these are my friends, Warren and Marla. What's your name? The girl jumped as though startled from a daydream. My name is... She began, but her hand flew to her lips and she looked suddenly ashamed. It isn't important, she said at last. She looked away and pulled the hood back over her head. Follow me. I'll show you the way to the one you call Anna Gree. They walked until the last of the cobweb tunnels lay far behind them. Garrett tried again and again to coax information from the mysterious girl in brown. Again and again, she would only look back over her shoulder at him and smile silently. He decided to try a different tact. How did Anna Gree become a ghost? he asked. Her name is Anna Lien, the girl in brown said, and she was once the Varishja of the city before humans came here. Varishja? Garrett asked. It's like a priestess of sorts, Marla said. I dare not disagree, noble lady, the girl in brown said. But to call her a priestess implies worship. It is plainer to say that she spoke for her people. Spoke for whom? Marla asked. To the ones that made us both, noble lady, the girl answered with a pearly grin. Marla frowned. Yeah, so why did she take the flower? Warren asked. The goblin's flower, the girl said. She did not take it. Then who did? Garrett asked. I did, she said. Why? Because Anna Lien asked me to, she said, shrugging her narrow shoulders. Warren groaned. And why did you... Stop, the girl in brown interrupted him. Before them, the tunnel opened into a vast subterranean chamber filled with light. 
Its walls, composed of white, seamless stone, curved up from the malachite floor to form a great dome overhead. The girl pointed toward the center of the chamber where stood a smaller dome-shaped building. From its many small, irregularly spaced windows poured the shimmering golden light. Ah! Warren said, shielding his eyes with a paw. Marla drew back, leaning against the wall of the tunnel. What's wrong? Garrett asked, moving to Marla's side. I don't know, she said, looking as though she might be sick. Garrett turned back to the girl in brown to ask her the source of the light. She was gone. Where did she go? Garrett asked. What? Warren looked at him, his snout wrinkled. The girl. Marla? Warren asked. No, the other girl. What are you talking about? The girl that led us here, Garrett said. She just disappeared. I led you here, Warren said. Garrett groaned in frustration. The girl that saved us from the spiders, he said. Where did she go? Marla saved us from the spiders, Warren said. With a little help from me, of course. Garrett rolled his eyes, waving his hands. Never mind, he turned to Marla. Did you see where she went? he asked. What are you talking about, Garrett? she said, rubbing her temples with her fingertips. The girl that... Garrett could no longer remember what it was that he was about to say. Something important was dancing just beyond the grasp of recollection. His mind fought to keep its hold on the thought as it slipped away from him. Garrett stood there, wondering what he had been trying to remember that was so important. And then he looked back to the center of the room and the strangely illuminated little building there. What is that god-awful light? Warren said. It's sunlight, Marla whispered. Chapter 10 That's as close to it as I'm going, Warren said. The ghoul held a furry forearm over his eyes to block out the golden light that streamed from the little windows of the dome at the center of the room. Marla had been able to approach no further than the tunnel's mouth in the wall of the large outer chamber. The light, she said, made her sick. Garrett thought it was beautiful. He handed Warren the unnecessary witchfire torch and moved closer to the center dome. He should be afraid, part of his brain reasoned. He was here to find a ghost, and ghosts should be frightening. But he could not imagine anything frightening inside that little sunlit house. He walked around the perimeter a short distance, squinting his eyes against the brilliance of the light. He soon found an open doorway. His sight still overwhelmed, he could make out no details within. Nevertheless, he stepped through the door. Garrett gasped, almost sobbing with the wave of emotion that swept over him as he entered the room. Golden warmth filled his body, and a scent like a summer meadow brought tears of half-remembered joys to his dazzled eyes. His knees trembled beneath him, and Garrett reeled, leaning a gloved hand against a stone doorframe for support. His fingers tingled as though he had plunged his bare hand into a stream of warm water. He pulled back his hand and stared at it, almost daring to rip the glove off to see if the scars were still there. Then he mastered himself, and his hand balled into a fist at his side. Welcome, a woman's voice said. Slowly the golden glow dimmed enough that Garrett could make out the interior of the room. The domed chamber seemed larger inside than it had from the outside, all manner of plants filled the room, planted in urns and troughs, stacked upon shelves and hanging in baskets above him. A large circular pool of blue water dominated the center of the room, and from the center of the pool rose a low stone pillar. Atop the pillar sat what appeared to be a crystal shard about the span of Garrett's hand. The crystal shimmered with what could only be described as pure sunlight. Garrett had seen no light so beautiful in the three years since coming to the city of Wither. A movement in a corner of his eye drew his attention, and there he saw his first ghost. Anna Gree stood a foot taller than Garrett. She was a slim woman, though obviously not a human. Her overly large eyes glowed a pale blue. Indeed, her thin body and her ornate robes gave off a faint azure glow, and he could see the wall behind her through her translucent form. She wore long, wispy hair that hung straight down on either side of her heart-shaped face, though the tips of her long, delicate ears poked out. She smiled at him, and he smiled back. His eyes fell then to the wasted stumps where her hands should have been. Hi, he said a bit hesitantly. My name is Garrett. 
I know, the ghost replied. My friend told me about you. Your friends are waiting outside, I take it? Yes, he said. The light is too bright for them. But it's not too bright for you? Garrett grinned. I think it's wonderful. Anna Grease's smile widened. Your friend told you about me? Garrett asked. The ghost watched him for a moment and then nodded. Your name is Annalian, isn't it? Garrett said. How did you know that? The ghost asked. I don't know, I just did, he said. It's like there's something... Something you're forgetting, Annalian mused. Yeah, Garrett said. It seems like I can almost remember, but then it's gone again. Annalian laughed, glanced sideways. Very interesting. Do you know what it is? he asked. It's not my place to say, Annalian answered, but I've got a feeling it will come back to you in time. I hope so, he said. So why did you come here? she asked. Oh, Garrett said, I'm sorry. I came here because the Goblin King said that you had his flower. Annalian laughed, a high, musical laugh. Yes, yes, I did steal his flower, I suppose. Would you mind giving it back? Garrett said. I mean, I could take it back for you if you'd let me. Annalian did not answer, but moved closer to Garrett, her ghostly sandaled feet making no sound as she approached him. Garrett felt suddenly uncomfortable, wanting to step back, but he forced himself to stand his ground as the ghost drew near. You don't seem very afraid of me, Annalian said, stopping only a few steps away from Garrett. I... I guess I am a little, he admitted. I've never seen a ghost before, it's just... Just what? Well, you don't seem very scary, he said. And this place isn't very scary either. Your friends didn't find it very inviting. They don't really like sunlight very much, he said. I see, Annalian said. Why is there sunlight here? Garrett asked. I mean, how can there be? Annalian looked back over her shoulder to the glowing crystal shard at the center of the room and sighed. It is beautiful, isn't it? I thought so myself when I first saw it. The day the old world died. The day I died. I don't understand, Garrett said. Annalian smiled and motioned for him to have a seat on a low stone bench half hidden among the ivy. She sat down beside him. She started to reach out to him with a handless stump and then drew it back, looking away. I lost my hands when I picked it up, she said. It had fallen from the sky, landing in the forest near the city. I saw it fall and followed it, believing that it was a sign that we might be saved. We had no hope, you see. The dragons had all fled away, and the elves simply awaited our doom. What doom? Garrett asked. She regarded him silently for a moment. Why, you're little more than a child, she exclaimed. I'm thirteen, he said. She laughed again. Garrett! Warren called from the outside. You all right in there? I'm fine, Garrett answered. Can you see well enough to come in? Ah, uh, I think I'll stay out here as long as you're all right. Your friend is very brave, Annalian chuckled. Garrett said nothing. Ah, yes, the ghost said. You asked what doom came to the elves. I owe you an answer. How many moons are there in the sky? she asked. Garrett paused, wondering if he had misunderstood the question. One moon, he said. Correct, she said. At least you are correct now. There was a time long ago when your answer would have seemed to me as foolish as my question seemed to you. There were once two moons in the sky. Garrett stared at her in disbelief. One, the moon you know now, silver and pale, still watches over the world above, but she had a sister. A crystal moon once hung in the sky beside her, and because of her there was no night. This second moon caught the light of the sun and cast it back down on the face of the world when the sun had set and all the world reveled in her beauty. Most of all, the dragons loved the crystal moon, for dragons love beautiful things, and nothing was so beautiful to them as her light. It was the only thing they loved that they could not possess, for their domain extended only to the skies above and not beyond. For this reason, they made a pact with a thing that could traverse the blackness between the worlds, a creature which had the power to give them the one thing they desired but could not reach. Garrett looked at the crystal shard at the center of the pool. 
You already guessed the end of my story, Annalian laughed. How can you... I mean, how would you even... A whole moon? Garrett said. If only you had been there to counsel the dragons, she laughed, and then grew somber. But then they would not have listened. They realized far too late they had been betrayed. What do you mean? Garrett asked. Who betrayed them? The enemy fulfilled its part of the bargain, she said. The crystal moon shifted from its sacred path and fell from the sky. By all sane reason, no one should have survived that day. What happened? I do not know, Annalene admitted. We waited for our end to come. The dragons fled to their respective fates, leaving us, their creations, to face our deaths alone. The crystal moon burned a fiery path through the sky, and we wept for the end of all beauty in life. And then... What? Garrett asked. Annalene shrugged her shoulders. I don't know what happened. There was a brilliant flash of light and then a roar that shook the earth. Where the moon had been before, now fiery stars of flame fell like tears from the red sky. One such tear, the one you've already guessed at, fell near here, and I hurried to see where it had fallen. I found it in a burned patch of forest at the bottom of a shallow hole in the earth. The shard lay there in the naked soil, wreathed in white flame. It was so beautiful. I reached out with both hands to take it up. The others found me there, senseless beside the stone, my hands burned to ash. The flames had cooled and so they took up the stone and my dying body to bring us back inside the city. I lived long enough to know that my people had survived that savage day, though the world would never be the same again. I don't know why I remained here when my body died. It feels as though I have something left to do, though I do not know what it is. Garrett chewed his lip. I don't understand. I mean, why are your hands still gone? If your real body is all dead and your ghost body is just a memory of what it was before, why doesn't it remember your hands the way they were too? The ghost laughed. <laughs> Look who's lecturing me on bad memories. A boy who can't even remember how he knows my real name. Garrett frowned. No, she said. It is a fair question, and I am ashamed to say I do not know the answer. I'm sorry, Garrett said. I just never met a ghost before. You're more accustomed to the less talkative dead, I assume, she said. Garrett nodded. Annalene smiled and looked away. This was once a city filled with life and boundless hope. I suppose the silent dead are its real masters now. Perhaps I should try being more like them. Garrett studied the toes of his boots for a while before speaking. I'm sorry, he said. I don't mean to offend you. I just wanted to ask you about the flower. Annalene turned back to him. She moved as though to put her hand on his shoulder and then let her wasted arm drop to her side. She sighed. The flower must stay with me, she said. But he really loves that flower, Garrett said, and I think the light here hurts him too much to come and ask you for it himself. A goblin who loves something, Annalene mused. Now that is an oddity worth a hundred ghosts. What do you mean, Garrett asked. Goblins were created for war, Annalene said. I was not the only one to have a bad day when the moon fell out of the sky. It drove the dragons mad. They could still sing their wonderful songs and call life into being from nothingness, only now their songs were full of sorrow and rage. Rage against everything. Rage against the race of men. Why? Garrett asked. I suppose because you took the world from us, Annalene said. You took what was once beautiful and pure and twisted it to your will. They hated you for that. They hated you so much that their hate twisted them and twisted their song. And so they sang into being creatures like the goblins, creatures created to wage endless war against mankind. Garrett stifled a laugh. The goblin didn't seem very scary, he said. Imagine a thousand of them waving swords and howling for your blood. And then imagine their masters behind them, driving them into battle, trolls, hydras and worse. Garrett nodded. He tried to imagine the massive troll trapper from the marketplace, only without the floppy leather hat and friendly smile. 
Now imagine an angry dragon flight ripping the clouds apart as they come sweeping down on your army and burning you all to cinders, Annalian said. Garrett flinched. He had no trouble imagining that. Annalian looked at him, suddenly comprehending. Oh, she said. Oh, I'm so sorry, boy. I think I talk too much sometimes. It's not often there's someone here to be hurt by it. It's all right, Garrett said. I got burned a long time ago. It doesn't hurt anymore. No, Annalene whispered. Some burns don't ever stop hurting. Not really. I'm so sorry. Anyway, Garrett said, I think the goblin really cares about this flower of his. He doesn't seem hateful at all. A little crazy, maybe, but he's not bad. Annalene seemed lost in thought. At last she spoke. The thing I can't figure out is where he found the rose. They sell roses in the market, Garrett offered. Maybe he got it from there. Annalene laughed. They don't sell blood roses in the market. I can promise you that. What's a blood rose? Come and look, the ghost said. She motioned for Garrett to follow her and led him over to a low table near the pool at the center of the room. Upon it sat various small potted plants, all in good health, save one. Nearest the source of the unnatural sunlight sat a little red pot from which sprouted a dry, twisted black vine, covered with little crimson-colored thorns and dark, brittle heart-shaped leaves. A single, unopened bud surmounted the tip of the vine. Is it dead? Garrett asked. It very nearly was, Annalene sighed. Perhaps you see now why I had to take it from him. He wasn't taking care of it? He can't take care of it, she said. He's a creature of darkness, and this rose needs light. They said he's had it for a while, Garrett said. Maybe he was trying to take care of it and just not getting it enough light. This is the only place in the city with the right kind of light for this rose. For all I know, maybe the only place left in the world, she said. No, I don't believe that. Talking too much again. What's so special about it? Garrett asked. She looked at him and frowned. You know of tragic stories for one day, boy. The rose stays with me, or it dies. It may take another century or two to finally give up the last little spark of life, but it will die without real light. And that's reason enough for me to hold on to it. But he really wants it back, Garrett pleaded. I think he's going to go crazy er, without it. Annalene smiled. Why do you care, human? Garrett stared back, dumbstruck. He shrugged his shoulders. I guess I just don't like seeing people lose things they care about. The ghost laughed. A goblin that loves something, and a human that cares about someone else. Perhaps the world is finally really coming to an end. I mean, maybe there's some way he could, I don't know, visit it or something, Garrett said. Annalene shook her head. You really aren't going to leave empty-handed, are you? I need to tell him something, Garrett said. All right then, Annalene said. I have an idea. Annalene walked to a nearby rack upon which hung various fruiting vines. She mumbled to herself as she inventoried them. This should do, she said at last. Come here, boy, I think this might work. Garrett approached to find Annalene pointing the stump of her right arm at a particularly unpleasant-looking dark blue vine covered with tiny red berries. Take a handful of those red berries there, Annalene said. I think our goblin friend will find them rather flavorful. What are they? Garrett asked. Fire vine, she said. Created by the dragons to feed warbred races like the goblins. Fortunately for the world above, the berries are seedless, but the vine spreads like, well, fire. Devilish stuff to be rid of once it gets a foothold in your garden. I have to have it trimmed back every few days to keep it in check. Who trims it for you? Garrett asked. Annalene smiled slyly. You're going to ask one too many questions someday, boy. Sorry. Don't be, she laughed. It's the only way to learn the best secrets. Garrett! Warren's voice called from outside. Are you still alive in there? Y yeah, he answered. I'm all right. Better take these and go, Annalene said. Your friends are getting impatient. Garrett plucked a handful of berries from the thorny blue vine, grateful to be wearing his gloves. Thank you, he said. But what if the goblin still wants his flower back? 
Annalene looked thoughtful. You can tell him that I'm taking care of it, and I'll give it back when it's doing a bit better. It may take a few weeks to get its blood flowing again. Thanks. Oh, she added, you probably shouldn't tell your vampire friend what kind of flower it really is. I'm sure she's a very nice girl, but she might mention it to the kind that aren't so nice. Then we would find ourselves in an uncomfortable situation. Garrett frowned, but nodded his head affirmatively. Oh, and don't be tempted to eat any of those berries either, Annalian said. They weren't made for humans. You're a good boy. I'd hate for you to die of a tummy ache. All right, he said, and thank you for, well, everything. The ghost smiled at him. Garrett turned to go, taking a last look at the golden glow of the moon shard. Annalian, he said, would it be all right if I came back sometime? Anytime you want, Garrett, she said.